Welcome to Relationship Status. We're in our third week of this series, and we've had fun so far. In the first week, a couple weeks ago, I opened up this series uh, talking about the importance of our relationships coming out of COVID, engaging uh, for some, re-engaging for others uh, with other people, and how important it is to have relationships with one another, uh, that even within those relationships that sometimes we have to have boundaries because there's some toxic and dysfunctional people around in our life. And even though we're called to love our neighbor as ourselves, sometimes for our own safety, our own mental health and our well-being, uh, we need to actually put in boundaries. I had a lot of people come and talk to me about that sermon, and, and it helped give a lot of breakthrough for other people and raise a lot of questions for some people. Uh, but when it comes to having relationships with each other, God has called us to live in community. We can't escape living in community. Last week, Liz preached an amazing message. Lonely. I'm Mr. Lone, about how God can bless us in spite of, um, even through our loneliness, and that he uses lonely people who understand loneliness to actually help other lonely people. Uh, you don't have to be lonely no more because you're in community, and you're in a family that loves you. Uh, today, I'm going to continue on our series and talk about another group of people that are in our community and our church. I get the privilege of uh, uh, marrying people, uh, performing weddings. People would call me a wedding celebrant, and I love it. The last wedding I did was a couple of weeks ago. It was Jay and Kai's wedding. Jay is one of our staff members, and he plays guitar for us. It was hands down the best wedding I've ever been to in my life. Was the ceremony incredible? Eh, it was okay. Was the food incredible? Eh, it was okay. They had a pool in the middle of their reception, and they wrote a note to all the guests that said, bring your swim shorts, your board shorts, and swim at the reception. So I did what every good person would do. I followed the instruction of the married couple. You know all these married couples today, they tell you what you need to wear at their wedding? Give me a break. I'm going to wear what I want to wear. This might be your day, but I've got limited amounts of clothing that I have. Right? So we went. So I took my swimming shorts, me and my little Indian friend, Pranav. We thought everyone was going to jump in the pool. Nobody else, just me and Pranav. And it was the best reception I've ever been to. Everybody's hot, sweaty. It's humid. It's in Bulacan. We're hot, me and Pranav, we're sitting in the pool. It was wonderful. But one of the things I get to do in a wedding is I stand with the two people, the man and the woman there, and I get to ask them these questions. And the questions are, will you choose to love, to honor, to respect in sickness and in health, for rich or for poor, in good times and in bad, till death do us part? The title of my message today is, Till death do us part. If you're married, I want you to look at your, your spouse that's right next to you. If they're sitting with you, I want you to look at them in the eyes and say, listen up. <laughs> Today, before I start, I want to just set a few foundational things. There's younger single people here today, and you'll be like, well, this doesn't really matter because I'm not married. <laughs> listen up. Because you're probably going to be married one day, and you're going to have issues, and you're going to wish you listened to my sermon on marriage. There's going to be other people here at the moment that you're married, and you're a little bit older, and you think to yourself, ah, I've been married. What's this young buck going to be able to teach me? Well, listen, I know a few older married people, and you all need as much help as us younger married people as well. You never stop growing in your marriage. Come on, some of the seasoned married people said... Amen. Some of the men are too scared to say amen because your wife is next to you, and you need this message today. 
There are older singles here, and you're thinking to yourself, well, why do I need, man, thank you for throwing this in my face that I'm not married. Well, here's the thing. Firstly, you never know God's plan for your life. You never know what's going to happen. Secondly, also, you can give good advice to people that you learned today. And then there's a last group of people that are here, and this is potentially the hardest one. It's a group of people that are here, and they were once married, but because of death or because of a failed marriage, they're not married anymore. Let me say a couple things. God can heal any pain that is coming to your life. Let me say this as well. Secondly, that divorce in my Bible, which I read, is not an unforgivable sin. It's definitely something that has human consequences that you will live with for the rest of your life, but it's not an unforgivable sin. Things might not have worked in the past, whether it was your fault or a partner's fault, but Jesus will always forgive you and he can make you new. The word of God promises us that the old is gone and the new has come. So if you're in that last category today, listen to me. I want you to hear this message with zero condemnation, with zero attack at all. I want you to listen to it and receive it from God that maybe he might restore something in your life that you never thought would happen, or he might heal a part of your life that you never thought could be healed. Amen? So with me laying that as the groundwork, the foundation today, let's talk about marriage. And I think I'm the perfect person to talk about marriage. You know why? I've got a great marriage. Do you know why? Because my marriage has issues. Any other married people got issues in your marriage? Come on, stick up your hand. I want to see if you can be honest. I'm the best person to talk about this. Why? Because my marriage isn't perfect. We have issues. Every time I do something romantic for Kate, which, again, one of our issues isn't as much as she would like. But every time I do something romantic for Kate, all the young girls in our church are like, oh my God, relationship goals, pastor, wow. I want to marry a man like pastor. And my response is never to fan that into flame. My response is this, no, you don't. You don't want a man like me? Are you kidding me? You know what Kate has to put up with at home? I come up here looking all polished and amazing. I'm not a great person all the time. I have issues. Do you know why I'm not a great person all the time? Because you're not a great person all the time. So I know what I'm like, which means I know what you're like. And so I never try and fan into flame that Kate and I, if you see our Instagram, it's not a perfect Instagram marriage at all. We got issues. In fact, I talk about our issues on stage to the point where, again, I get in trouble when I go home for talking about our issues on our stage. Why did you have to call me Kermit? I didn't think you had to call me Kermit. Why? Why? Then you stand me up in front of everyone. Do you know how embarrassed I was? But I did it because I'm submissive, but I didn't love it. I love marriage. I love it. The Bible loves marriage. You know, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, it says this, he who finds a wife finds a good thing mm. and obtain favor from the Lord. I'm telling you, I have a good thing and I've got favor from the Lord. I love marriage. Marriage is great. Let's go back to the beginning. Where did marriage start? Genesis 1, God makes man in his image and then man realizes that he's alone. And the animals, as great as they are, will never fulfill what another human being can. And so God comes, puts man to sleep, takes a rib out of him. I just want to know how many ribs we used to have as men. Like, did it just keep going all the way down? <laughs> Removes a rib and creates woman next to him. And in Genesis 2, 24, God yokes Adam and Eve together and they become one flesh. Marriage is the beautiful reflection of the image of God. And that's why when marriages breaks down, it doesn't reflect the true image of God and it breaks down every aspect of society. When we talk about marriage, I'm not just talking about your romantic feelings for another person and I want to spend the rest of my life with you at all. We are talking about the foundation of our society. Marriages and families are the foundations of our society and healthy marriages will reflect a healthy community and society. But the truth is in the opposite way. 
unhealthy marriages will lead to an unhealthy society. And so for this reason, from the very beginning of time, Satan, the great accuser, the prince of darkness, Lucifer, has been trying to attack marriages and pull husbands and wives apart. Tempting Adam and Eve all the way back in Genesis was an attack from Satan against their marriages. He attacks homes. He attacks marriages. Why? Because Satan hates it when we reflect the beautiful image of God. And so he wants to tear it apart. He wants to tear down the beautiful image and reflection of God. And as the home is attacked and as marriages break down, the image of God is attacked. It's distorted. And societies look and become farther and farther away from God's image and design. And so today, you got to understand, this message is important for everyone, but especially, can I say this, especially the young singles. Do you know why? Because we've had terrible models of marriage growing up. Now, you might be like, hey, my parents were great. That's fantastic. What I found in our church, I'm going to speak just on what I know in our church. If your parents had a great godly marriage and they showed you that, you are in the minority in our church. Because I know a lot of people in our church that grew up with pretty dysfunctional families. There's a lot of people in our church who your father had another family. There's a lot of people in our church, you are the other family. There's a lot of people in our church that grew up with fathers, mothers fighting, doing this, doing that, just really dysfunctional, ungodly marriages. And so we actually need to come back to, what does the Bible say is a godly marriage? We need to learn. If you grew up with great parents, you're like, well, I had great parents. Well, unfortunately, the rest of society and the world throws bad marriages at you. Hollywood, for example, gives us a a perception of the most crazy bad marriages out there. All these television sitcoms display these married men as little dribbling weak men who are just trying to not get in trouble with their wife and hopefully as a reward they'll get sex from their wife at some point. That's what Hollywood displays as a marriage in all their sitcoms. Then unfortunately they swing the other way. They give us then the rom-coms where they had these perfect men that don't make mistakes that come there. And women will show up and say, I'm just a girl. (laughs) Standing in front of a boy. (laughs) Asking him to love me. And we're like, oh my God. It's going to be like that forever. I call it the Disney princess syndrome. Especially in girls where they've grown up with the Disney prince and they think that that's what their marriage is going to be like. And you wake up after marriage, you look at him, you're like, what, what, what? <laughs> Where's my breakfast in bed? Where's my kiss forever after? And he goes, baby, this is, this is it. <laughs> God calls us to a higher level of living in every area of our life, but especially in marriages. You know, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, it says this, marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. So today, with a topic that we should honor, this topic of marriage, that really deserves 73 weeks of intensive training and teaching and listening to, I'm going to try and do it all in one sermon. I'm going to try and fix your marriage as much as I can. And we're going to look at how we can do marriage as well. Because I want to ask you, all the married people in this room, what's the status of your relationship? Is it good? Is it great? Is it okay? Is it terrible? Wherever you are today, I want to try and put some truths in to take it from okay to great. To take it from terrible to good. To take it from great to fantastic, amazing. So we're going to go to the Bible. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. This is one of the most famous scriptures in the Bible when it comes to marriages. Usually people start at verse 22, but I'm going to start at verse 21 for a specific reason. It says this, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
Wives, submit, to yourselves, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh." This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I want to pull out some thoughts from this passage. The first is this. Make Jesus the center of your marriage. Make Jesus the center of your marriage. Obviously, we all know this. But we're actually going to talk about what it looks like. Before I talk about our individual responsibilities that we have to each other and that Paul even shows us that we have, I've got to give you the biggest spoiler alert. If you want a great marriage, Jesus needs to be the center of your marriage, not on the side, not your once a week gathering that you have when you come to church, but the center of your marriage. Paul is talking here about our individual responsibilities as spouses, but it's all intertwined with who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. And before Paul got to this little marriage seminar in verse 21, he started off this chapter in verse 1 by saying this, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So Paul's setting up, before he even gets to talking about what we have to do in marriage, he's saying to each one of us, before you even think about your spouse, you've got to love God and have a relationship with Jesus. This is why I tell all the young single people in our church, don't marry someone that goes to church. What? Isn't that who we should marry? No. Don't marry someone that goes to church. Marry someone who loves Jesus more than they love you. That's what you got to look for. Some of those people go to church, but there's some of those people don't go to church. Sorry, no, all those people go to church, but there's some people that go to church that maybe don't love Jesus more than you. Once Jesus is the center of your life, then he can become the center of your marriage. So it sounds cool, right? This is good. Like, yes, make Jesus the center of our marriage. Cool. Let's, let's do that. But what does that, what does that look like? Like everybody's got their own, like Paul doesn't really go on to say, hey, this is how you make Jesus the center of your marriage by doing da 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 all this kind of stuff. We get thoughts throughout the Bible that will help us in our relationship with Christ, but what does Jesus being the center of your marriage look like? Well, everyone's got their own opinion, so I want to say two things to you today. Firstly, go ask a great godly Christian couple how Jesus is the center of their marriage. Learn. Learn from people that have been doing it longer than you. What does it look like for Jesus to be the center of your marriage? Secondly, I want to give you my opinion on how Jesus looks the center in our marriage with Kate and I. I love you, Kate. I said to Kate, if I tell any stories that I shouldn't, just go like this really quickly, because usually I just make up stories on the spot. Do you know what Jesus being the center of our relationship looks like? It's this. I want you to really get this. It looks like us being constantly realigned to Jesus in our personal lives. So listen to me, listen to me. I got to explain this to you. So Jesus in the center of our marriage looks like us personally, apart from each other, constantly being realigned to Jesus and living and walking and breathing by how Jesus wants us to live. So do we pray together? Yes, we pray together, but that doesn't make Jesus the center of our marriage. Do we worship together? Yes, we worship together at home. Do we come to church? Yes, church is a priority. Since the day we got married, church has always been a priority for us. Yes, we talk about the things of God, but the biggest reflection I have of Christ being in the center of our marriage is that, listen to me, we both 
constantly realign to the ways of Christ in our individual lives. Thus, our personal realignment always affects and it reflects in our joint alignment that we have together. Let me give you a practical example to help you explain what I'm talking about. Kate and I, over the years, have had something called uh, disagreements and fights, right? We've had some good fights. Boy, can she fight. And it always happens late at night when I'm tired. Any other people know what I'm talking about? It's like, why couldn't we have had this fight at 1 p.m. in the afternoon? Why is it 11 p.m. at night? And now I'm going to have to be up till 3 a.m. for this. And you know what I'm saying? Like, we have had some, we've had some doozies. We've had some big fights. Fights about each other, fights about our children, fights about the church, fights about other stuff. We, we've had some big, big fights in our nearly 14 years of marriage. I want to tell you this from the bottom of my heart. I have never, ever once feared that this fight would end it all. Let me, let me be blunt. I have never feared. We have never said the D word, divorce. We've never joked about it. We've never talked about it. We don't joke about leaving each other at all. Like we... We don't do that. In our world, we don't talk about that. I'm telling you, we've had some big fights, but I have never, ever, ever had a fear that a fight would lead to our separation or that this fight would not be resolved. Do you know why I've never had that fear? Because I love Jesus and I know Kate does. That's actually simply what it is. Some people want a big key. Well, give me the key to marriage. Give me the key. The key to marriage is this. Love Jesus with all your heart with all your mind, with all your soul. Why? Because in the heat, in the emotion, in the passion of a fight, you're going to say stupid stuff. You're going to do stupid things in that moment. But I know this, that when the sun comes up, maybe on the second or third day on some of these fights, but when the sun comes up, whoever is out of alignment, either of us who is out of alignment, whether it's both of us or one of us more than the other, at some point, I have a confidence in Kate's relationship with Jesus that she's going to go on her prayer walk around our subdivision, and she may be angry at first. I can't believe, gee, James, he did. Why, you made me marry him, and he should, I should have married that other guy, which I know, but I don't say that because we don't joke about that in our marriage. We never joke about marrying someone else. And she, she, but then I know Kate loves Jesus, and God will begin, daughter, daughter. Daughter, I have given you a treasure. Sometimes he doesn't look like a treasure, but it's a beautiful, deep treasure. So dig deep. Remember, I died on the cross for you. Okay, Lord. And you know what? Kate will come back. She was like, hey, I'm sorry. Not, not because I manipulated her, not because I didn't. Do you know why? Because she actually, she actually loves Jesus. And she'll come back. If I'm in the wrong, I'll go to the gym. <laughs> Why the heck does she, doesn't she know how lucky she is? Do you know how many women would love their husband to constantly be trying to touch them and kiss them and love them? But, but here's the thing. I love Jesus so much, right? You, you get what I'm saying? You're getting the point here. It's actually not about my love for her. My love for her doesn't actually deal with my pride. It's my love for Christ that that's when he comes in, son, you're a blessed man. Yeah, you got to work stuff out, but she's a good woman. You are a blessed, yeah, she is. And I come back and I humbly apologize and go, I'm sorry for what I did. When I encounter Jesus, then that way, you know what he does? He softens my heart. And once I cool down, I can then step into my calling as a husband, which is to love and lead her in a sacrificial way. I have never met a couple who both genuinely chase after Jesus whose marriages have fallen apart. 
I've never. I know it's a big statement. Maybe think it through a little bit. But I'm talking about if they are both actively in love with Christ, where Christ is the center of their individual lives. I've never seen a marriage breakdown consisting of two people who are actively going after Jesus. Why? It would be impossible for a marriage to break down if you're actively going after Christ, because if you're actively going after Christ, he is shaping you, he is forming you, the fruit of his spirit is coming out inside of you. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, everything you need in a marriage will come out as you follow Christ. Never seen it. We got to make Jesus the center of our lives, and he will naturally become the center of our marriage. I I talked about this a a couple of months ago, I think, and I got some pretty uh, interesting response from it, but I was talking about this idea of, uh, you know, I've never had an affair on Kate. Uh, Surprise. Uh, I'm nice, and, uh, and so I've never cheated on Kate. And I said, the reason why I've never cheated on Kate is not actually because of my love for her. Some people are kind of like, wait, what? What, is, what do you mean by that? I, I've never cheated on Kate, and I plan to never cheat on Kate, to never have an affair, uh, to never uh, sleep with someone that I'm not married to, to never go to a massage parlor that way, to never do anything. The, the, what's it called? What do we call it? No, I'm not allowed to say what it's called, apparently. <laughs> I'll say it at the 4 p.m. service. Come back. <laughs> what does he mean, 4 p.m. service? Uh, the spot, yeah, right? I, do, you, do you know why I plan? Can I just tell you? Do you know why I plan to never do that? It's not because of how I feel about Kate and I love her. Do you know why? It's because I fear God. Now, listen to me. Some of you are like, what? What does that mean? Can I give you a little clue? And all the married people are going to say amen. The single people are going to be like, what? Really? There are days that I don't feel like I love my wife. Come on, married people. There are days when I'm like, nope. Be gone. It's in the, well, Kate and I had this huge fight. About four months into our, six months into our marriage, we had this huge fight, right? And I was on a diet trying to lose weight because she told me I needed to lose weight, right? So I was on a diet. We had this massive fight and we drove, I drove home. I nearly tipped the car coming around the corner just to scare her a little bit, right? I slammed on the brakes. She got out and I was so angry at her. I wanted, I wanted revenge, right? Do you know what I did? I drove to McDonald's. And I got a double quarter pounder with cheese, extra large fry. And as I was eating this, I'm like, take that. I'm going to get fat. You're going to have a fat husband. But you screw you. I'm going to be fat. Ah, 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 right? I'm so angry. In that moment, I didn't feel like I loved my wife. Right? But I've seen men not go to McDonald's. They've gone to other places. So listen to me, listen to me. I've seen people react differently because of a fight. I've seen people be worn down over weeks and months and even years, and then one day just leave and do something that they should never have done. But, but can I tell you, it doesn't matter how bad she is or how bad I am. Do you know why we're going to stay together forever? I'll tell you this, because I fear God. I never want to do something with somebody else. Do you know why? Because I, I really, really love God. Jesus, and that would be outside of the way Jesus has called me to live. Are you getting this? If you get Jesus, before we even talk about wash the dishes more, right? Help, clean up, pick your clothes off the floor, give her a flower every now and then. You know, massage, massage his feet without an expectation of it leading anywhere, women. That's a joke for all the married people because that never happens. It's always the other way around. Some of y'all get that when you're a little bit older. Right? Instead of doing all that, do you know how you're going to have a great marriage? You know how you're going to have a great marriage? The number one key, let Jesus be the center of your life. You get him the center of your life, he's going to become naturally the center of your marriage. So yes, you will want to pray together. You will want to worship together. You will prioritize church together. You will talk of the things of God in your life together, but it will come out of the overflow of your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Make Jesus the center of your life, and he'll naturally become the center of your marriage. Amen? I said amen. Amen. Number two is this. 
We want to have a great marriage? We have to submit to one another. So there, there's been lots of crazy, chauvinistic, little men preachers who love to preach this sermon, and they start at verse 22. I said I wanted to start at verse 21 because I think Paul puts it in there for a very specific reason. The, the basis of Paul's very legitimate claim for women to submit to their husbands, it comes off the back of Paul saying that we should all submit to each other because of Jesus. So Paul says, submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. Now I'm about to tell you how this is going to look. So for you ladies, you need to submit to your husband in everything. Why? Because the husband is the head of your home. He's the head of his wife, just like Christ is the head of him. Eve, all the way back in the garden, did not submit her decision to disobey God to her husband. And so since the beginning of time, there's been this almost rising up in our nature of not wanting to submit, to buck against this submission claim. And many horrible men have taken advantage of this. Many horrible men have put this out of context. Be quiet, sit down, submit to me. If I tell you what shoes to wear, wear those shoes because you need to submit to me because I'm your husband. From stupid things like what shoes you wear to what, how you're going to look, to how you're going to raise your children, all these kind of things. And many men have taken this just out of context. Many men have used this as an example to stay with abusive husbands. That's absolutely incorrect. That is an incorrect view of the context of this scripture. Submission is not a reflection of worth. Let me say it again so it just sits on you. Submission is not a reflection of worth. As I read the Bible as a whole, I see how affirming God is to women and their worth, especially when you read the Bible through the context, the eyes of that time where it almost went against the context, the cultural setting to be as affirming as Jesus was and as affirming as God. God is very affirming to women. Submission is a reflection not of your worth, but of godly order in the home. And when a woman submits, a, a wife submits to her husband, it flows beautifully when it's met by a husband who is taking his responsibility seriously. And this is where we talk to the fellas for a little bit, because the fellas love that bit. Yeah, preach, pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Submit to me, yeah, yeah, see, yeah, right? Now we get to, to, to what I think is the harder bit. It's easy to submit when you compare it to what a husband has to do. You know what a husband has to do? A husband has to love you like Christ loved the church. Do you know how Christ loved the church? He died for the church. He sacrificed everything yet. He gave up everything yet. Ladies, all you have to do is submit. Men, you have to give up your life for your wife. You have to sacrificially love her, respect her, honor, put her desires, put her needs before yours. Men's submission to their wives is a sacrificial love and honor and respect, just like Christ has shown the church. And this is where we get to the statement that I've been making recently with a lot of married couples. I've been talking to married couples. They're like, hey, give us your advice. What, what would you do? And I've been making this statement, which is this. Don't ever stop trying. In your marriage, don't ever stop trying. Marriages work when both couples try. Well, why? I think you can, you can trace the breakdowns of many marriages back to a moment where one of the spouses within that marriage stopped trying. Whether it was sin, whether it was laziness, whatever it was, they just stopped trying. Let me explain this to you practically in how marriage looks, right? Let's view marriage as a circle, like this beautiful unending circle that just goes around and around and around, right? This beautiful, that's probably an easier way of doing circle. I don't know why. I said, the last airbender, wah, right? And so, I'm not sure. Anyway, this, this beautiful circle, right? And so, so this is what's beautiful about a marriage. Uh, let's start with the wives, right? A, a wife's part of the circle is that they're supposed to submit to their husbands, love their husbands, care for their husbands, put his needs first, put his desires first, respect 
their husbands. Encourage, give them words of affirmation, love. And then we get to the man's point of the circle. And a man, what's a man supposed to do? Love his wife. Put her needs first. Sacrifice for her. Love, respect her. Love her like Jesus loved the church. And then as he does this, guess what his wife will do? She'll meet him with love and respect and with submission and with putting his needs and his desires first. And as she does that, he'll meet her with love and respect and submitting to her in a godly way and putting her needs and desires first and being so romantic and going to the gym and getting healthier for her. And then she'll meet him, and it goes in this beautiful, that, that's what marriage was designed to be, this beautiful circle of give, 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 give. So who starts first? Who starts first? Who cares? You. You start first. Yeah, maybe the husband should start first because he's the leader, but you start first, whoever you are. Yeah but she doesn't respect me. Good. Become someone that she will want to respect. Yeah, well, well, well you know, he, he doesn't meet my needs. Okay, well, maybe start loving him and putting his needs first, and it might change something inside of him. Marriage works when we both take responsibility for our own actions and our own desires that we have, push our desires aside and go, okay, what do you want? What can I do to serve you? How can I serve and love you? There are moments where I don't want to live this out. Anybody else? Well, why should I do it? She's not doing it to me. Do you know why I need to do it? Because this is what Jesus did for me. Jesus died for me before I even acknowledged it. Jesus has been there for me in my toughest, hardest moments where I've turned my back on him. Why, why, how do I deserve eternal life? How do I deserve someone who would go on the cross and die for me? I don't deserve it. And so when I remember that, does my wife deserve my love today? Uh, maybe she doesn't, but because I don't deserve Jesus' love, I'm going to give her my love. Do you know why? Because as a husband, I'm called to love her like Christ loved the church. So what if you're here and you have a spouse that doesn't know Jesus, doesn't love Jesus? You're here, maybe you're at church alone, maybe you're watching online alone and your, your spouse doesn't love Jesus. Well, Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. He says, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, as in they don't believe in Jesus, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. This is beautiful. It's talking to wives, but I know that there's husbands who have wives who aren't believers. And Peter encourages, hey, let your behavior, let your submission, let your love. He, he goes on in that scripture to talk about what a wife should do and how she should look and how she should act and respond. But ultimately, he comes back to let your love of Jesus begin to flow out to your husband. And that might actually show him more of the love of Jesus than you just trying to preach to him all the time. You sitting there preaching, well, you should go and give him Jesus and you're going to hell. <laughs> the Proverbs talks about a wife that's like a, 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 a drip from a leaky roof that's terrible. Man, why don't you? <laughs> no, why don't you just love your husband and show him the love of Christ through your actions and through your words? Love your wife who doesn't know Jesus. Show her the love of Christ through your actions and your words. Let me tell you this. I want to challenge you. Husbands and wives, make sure you're acting like Christians at home, not just at church. Make sure you're reflecting Jesus at home, not just at church. All right, time's running out. I got two more points. Third one is this. Oh, this is going to be good and controversial. You want to have a great marriage? Put your marriage before your kids. Put your marriage before your kids. Um, do you realize the Bible talks a lot more about marriages than it does about parenting? Do you realize it talks a lot more about how to love, how to respect, how to honor, how to be with marriages? You know, uh, the book of the Song of Solomon, that's a wild, woo, that's a wild book on marriage and love. But it actually talks a lot of, uh, about it a lot more. Do you know why? Because you're going to live with your spouse a lot longer than you're going to live with your children. Next week, Willem is going to be preaching on parenting, and he's going to teach us all how to be perfect parents, like him and Shiloh are perfect parents, 
to their children. So you just gotta wait for that. But this is where we gotta balance this tension because some of you, when I said that, let me just tell you what I know has just happened. When I've said put your marriage before your children, some, there's different reactions that's just happened in the room, right? Some of you are like, yes, sweet. Oh, let's go on a vacation and leave our children with whoever, right? Some of you are in the other way like, oh, how dare you say that? Our children are the most important things on this earth. God's called us to steward them and to love them. And how dare you dishonor and disrespect my children, Okay, so, and then there's everything in between, right? There's like, like the both. So we gotta balance and tension this out. Um, there's a great man that I love. His name's Chuck Quinley. He was a missionary here in the Philippines for many years. Some of you might even know him. And he taught me this lesson pretty early on that my wife mattered more than my kids. And he would tell the story about how he would go on a date night every week with his kids and he had six children. Man, six of them, my God, I, I don't even know how to do three. <laughs> He took what I did and doubled it, right? And so with each one of his six children, he would go out on a date and each of them would get to the age where they would kind of look up and they would realize that mom and dad were leaving them for the night or leaving them for a vacation because they would go vacations without their children. It's the dream. And, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, you know where I sit on the spectrum. And, uh, and I'll explain in just a moment. And, and once they would get to the age, they would look and go, Daddy, how come you're going out with Mommy? You're leaving us. And he would look at them and he'd say, well, you know, whoever it was, the little baby, he would say, it's because Daddy really loves Mommy, and Daddy was dating Mommy long before you came along, and Daddy's still going to be dating Mommy long after you leave. And they're like, oh, and then they basically cried, and <laughs> they would walk out and go on their date and have a good time. But... I learned a lot from this family in their home because I would see the parents. I would see them on family vacations. We'd all go out, and us kids would all be hanging out, and, and the parents would kind of just go off and walk by themselves holding each other. They were like in their 50s, and they got their hand in their butt pocket like that. I'm like, oh, my God, that's so sexy. <laughs> my relationship goals, I'm like that, right? And, and so, so I would see this thing, and, it, and it, it stirred something inside of me, and I was thinking, you know what? This is so true, and I've really implemented this. Kate and I have implemented this in our marriage is that we're really clear, I've talked on this many times before, that I actually love Kate more than I love my children. And the healthiest thing that I can give my children is actually not my love to them, it's my love to Kate. There's a lot of people here that grew up in pretty dysfunctional homes. And why was it dysfunctional? Because you didn't see your father love your mother. So the best thing that I can do for my children is actually love their mother with all my heart. And I prioritize Kate over my children. Now listen to me, balance of the tension. So this doesn't mean like, Pam, screw you, you know, uh, go, a yaya or a nanny can raise you because pastor said, I have to prioritize my mother. No, 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 listen to me. If you're blessed to have a yaya and a nanny, can I encourage you? Make sure that you raise your kids and not them. Because when they grow up, they're going to look more like your yaya and your nanny rather than you. You know, I saw a video a couple years ago before Kate and I had children, and we were thinking about, okay, should we get some help to help us with this? And I watched this video, and it, and it changed my whole perspective of having kids, especially here in the Philippines. International people are like, what is a yaya? That's like a nanny, right? And so I saw this video of Singapore families, Singapore families, and they interviewed, they interviewed the the yaya, who was a Filipino, all these Filipino yayas that were there, they interviewed the Singapore mother and then they interviewed the children. And so they would ask the, the mother, uh, who's your child's best friend? They would give an answer. The yaya, they'd ask the same, who's the child's best friend? They would give an answer, then they, they'd ask the kids. 98% of the questions the mother got wrong, the yaya got right. You know what, you know what, you know what got me, so, what, what, what gripped my heart so much? is that they said to this one lady, I'll never forget it. They said, does your child uh, come into your bedroom at night? The mother goes, no, not at all. He's really good. He sleeps through the night all the time. They cut to the yaya. Yeah, most nights he comes into my bedroom at night. And I remember seeing that and I'm like, God, I'm so thankful for help. I'm so thankful for people that can help us in our life, but I will never be a parent 
that throws my children off to somebody, I will be the main voice, I will be the main authority, I will be the main disciplinarian, I will be the main provider of love and care in my parents. I love help, I'm so grateful for help. Help allows us to do what we do, but I, I want to be that parent. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying get rid of your kids, but in the same breath as well, if Kate and I aren't healthy, then I am not going to be a great parent. If Kate and I aren't healthy, our children are gonna grow up in an environment where it's like, uh, they don't know. I went to a birthday party on Friday night. Uh, Joel, happy birthday. It's your birthday today. I was at Joel's birthday party on Friday night, and we had this photo booth, and so we're taking photos, and me and Kate did the photo booth, everything, and one of the photos, I kissed Kate because I love to kiss her. She's just a kissable woman, right? And so my son, the, the next day, we had these little photos from the photo booth. I said, I said, as I, what's your favorite photo of all the photos? And he goes, the one where you and mommy are kissing. And I went, oh, man, I love that. Like, I love that it's normal for my son to see his mom and dad kissing. Now, some of us grew up in a generation, like I grew up in a generation where my parents would kiss in front of, but not like a lot. Like, I love my, shout out to my parents, but it's like I had no concept that they'd ever had sex other than just to produce me and my two sisters, right? I had no concept of it, right? I, I just didn't realize it. So I'm, I'm growing up in our home. I want our kids to know how much I love their mommy, how much I love their mom. Why? Because that makes them safe. And I want to challenge you, if you have young kids, even have old kids, whatever kids you have in between, you got to prioritize your marriage because if you're not healthy, you guys are the heads of your family. And if you're not healthy and you're out of alignment, it's going to trickle down to your children. And the very thing that you think you're doing to love your children, you're actually doing the wrong thing. Don't let the children be the center of your marriage. Let your marriage be the center of your marriage and let it flow down. You can still take into practice. You can still love on them. You can still do everything, but let them see two people. There are people in this room that need to go on a vacation without your children. How do you do that? I don't know, but pray about it. Pray that you have family members that will help look after your kids for a couple days. Do a swap with another family. You look after their kids, they look after your kids. I don't know what you do, but you need to pray about taking a couple days off with your wife. Heaven knows I'm praying for it in Jesus' name. I'm flying my parents from Australia to Manila so that I can take some time with Kate. That's how much I'm prioritizing my time with her. Amen? Have go okay, thank you for the amen, Willem. <laughs> Willem's going to Korea. He's not even taking his children. He's just going to Korea. <laughs> I'm joking. He's taking his children. All right, last point, then we're going to pray. Last point is this. You want to have a great marriage, and you got to understand this. Your spouse isn't your soulmate. <laughs> oh, this is going to annoy some people. Your spouse isn't your soulmate. We have this thing of like this mystical, like, he's my soulmate. It's just he's the one. I know he's the one. People ask me all the time, do you believe in the one, James? Well, obviously I don't because I've been married twice, so I kind of broke that rule. But I believe that whoever you marry becomes the one, right? But there's no mystical soulmate. God will bring along someone's best for you, you'll marry, and they become the one. I think that one of the damages that's happened to society, and it unbelievably infects the church, was, was because of some stupid movie in the 90s called Jerry Maguire, right? There was a movie. Some of y'all weren't even born when this happened, so you don't know what I'm talking about, but Jerry Maguire, show me the money, 